So tonight I'm going to bring on our friend Timothy Alberino, who just had a really great spot with Steve Bannon not too long ago. He's an author. He's a researcher. He's an explorer. He's been on this show f- to talk about all types of these these topics and beyond. And I, I particularly love talking to Timothy when we get to take these topics and mesh them together and see how uh, interdependent they all are. Timothy Alberino, welcome back to the show. How you doing? Good to be back, Frank. Doing well. Hey, you, great spot with Bannon the other day. It was awesome to see you getting uh, you and Birthright getting a lot of well-deserved attention. Thank you. Well, here's two first two questions that I want to ask you before we go on to the bigger stuff. Um, I want to ask you two questions as a citizen of Montana. First, did you see the first balloon? And second, what the hell was that shoot down after the first balloon was already over uh, Missouri? And no, we heard about a big shoot down over uh, Montana. Never heard about it again. What was blown out of the skies? Well, first of all, I think that it's fair to say that nobody knows what the hell's going on. The government is is being less than truthful, let's put it that way. I don't know what they shot over Billings, Montana, what they shot down, but they certainly blew something out of the sky. Now, it appears to me at this point that after the original incident with the Chinese balloon, which was certainly a Chinese balloon, the Chinese admitted as much, It appears to me that the Biden administration has been engaging in the takedown of Hobby Lobby balloons that fly about 20,000 feet uh, at an altitude of about 20,000 feet that are completely benign and that are belong to amateur researchers. So we've basically been scrambling jets, at least in a couple of these cases. Every time we scramble one of those jets, it costs us hundreds of thousands of dollars, if not millions. And each sidewinder that we shoot at these things costs $400,000. We missed the first shot over the Lake Huron at at that uh, octagonal-shaped object, which, by the way, for all of those who are speculating about UFOs, they forget the little detail that it had cords. It had cords attached to it that were hanging down. It's a freaking balloon. And they... (laughs) They missed it on the first shot, <laughs> and then they took it down on the second, and uh, and so it seems to me that what an Im- this this is uh, a, a an embarrassment of enormous proportions for the for the Biden administration after fumbling the first incident with the actual Chinese spy balloon. There's no doubt it was a Chinese spy balloon. Um, and then going out and trying to flex your muscle and shooting down Hobby Lobby balloons. What? A freaking circus. Hmm. I, I know, I know. And, you know, and this, this is the, the, the thing that I have been wondering because things that kind of seemed innocuous or just goofy at first, uh, they, they have more often than not turned into greater, more serious issues as they build up and they build momentum and they're steered by the media and the government that is behind it and the and the other entities that are behind them. So with everything happening in the last month, I know a lot of people have been going out there to really take account of that. We had the uh, we had the, the Nord Stream uh, uh, revelations again. NATO escalation of World War III, Hunter Biden laptop story continues to get uh, more and more verified. Uh, it goes on and on, it really does. Uh, FTX continue, I just said that before, Pfizer and Project Veritas. So. Everybody's very quick to to say that anything that comes out with all these other things are happening would be a distraction. Then again, if the UFO thing wasn't around, one of these things I just listed would have been a distraction for the other things. So my per, my my thing here is what purpose do the high altitude anomalies serve? Is it purely distraction or could you conceive of any other secondary function? Well, as I said on Bannon's program, I find it exceedingly interesting that the Pentagon is using the public's interest in UFOs as a diversion right now to try and obfuscate the spycraft activity in our airspace by foreign actors, maybe not just China, maybe Russia and Iran. And it may not just be balloons, it may be uh, it may be drones as well. Because the reason why this is so fascinating to me is because usually, historically, it's been the other way around. Usually, the government uses the excuse of high-altitude high balloons and drones and birds and swamp gas 
to cover up legitimate UFO activity. And when I use the word legitimate, authentic UFO activity, I'm talking about the kind of craft, advanced aerospace craft, that are capable of these incredible feats, aerial feats, right angle turns at high rates of speed, um, disappearing off of radar, uh, flying down into the ocean without making a splash. I mean, obviously, there's some kind of an exceedingly um, advanced technology in play here. These are not balloons. Those are authentic UFOs. And the, and the government, are in a, the military, the U.S. military, the Air Force, and the Navy routinely encounter legitimate UFOs all the time. We know about the Nimitz incident in 2000 that broke in 2017 via the New York Times article, but that it's that's commonplace. It's been happening for decades, and there are many, many reports about it that have surfaced over the decades. Plausible, I mean, uh, um, credible reports from from military sources and pilots and sailors, and so on. Now, I think that in order to really start to maybe understand the the distractionary aspect of all this we need to comprehend these incidents in the context of the confluence of events that have been unfolding over the last couple of years especially this year we have had frequent train derailments food processing plants burning to the ground chicken feed ba basically being poisoned water treatment facilities hacked and poisoned, attacks on our electrical grid in various parts of the country, airlines shut down for an entire day, unprecedented. It only happened during 9-11. We never really got a, a, a plausible ex, uh, explanation as to why that happened. Uh, of course, the toxic chemical Chernobyl that's unfolding in East Palestine, Ohio. And now surveillance craft hovering over some of our most sensitive military installations, certainly here in Montana. I live in the nuclear sponge. There are many, many nuclear silos in Montana and, and uh, sensitive underground bases. None of this is coincidental. None of, none of these events, including these balloons, not the stupid Hobby Lobby balloons, but the Chinese, the real one, the, the, the Chinese uh, spy balloon, none of those incidents should be viewed in isolation. These incidents are somehow connected. I think that uh, I think that what we're seeing is subversive activity from a foreign actor. I think we're, our systems are being hacked. I think what we have, and, and, I'll, and I'm going to tell you why the government doesn't want to talk about this, because we have a southern border that is wide open. So you can have subversive actors coming in from China, Iran, Russia and anywhere else around the world, all they have to do is come across that border with the aid of the cartels. They get across the border. You, ha you can have cells of, uh, let's call them terrorist cells, in the United States who are sabotaging our, ro our railroads, who are sabotaging our, our burning our, our food plants to the ground, poisoning our water, and, and our government can't stop them because it's inept, number one. Maybe number two, it doesn't care to stop them. But number three, and this is the big one, it can't let us know about this because then it would implicate Biden and his inability to close our border. Not his inability, his refusal to close our southern border. And so I think what we're seeing are, are subversive actions by foreign agents. And all of these things, that's every one of the things that I just named, I, I think we can attribute to subversive uh, operations by foreign actors or, or at the very least, you know, eco-terrorists, which is another option. But I, I kind of doubt that. I think what we're seeing is a systematic attack on our, on our food, on our water, on our energy, and on our rail system. At the same time, we're being surveilled with these balloons. And the balloon is more of a China giving us the finger and saying, what are you going to do about it? They're testing us. They're testing the Biden administration. They're making him into a laughing stock on a national stage. All of these things are in play. And I want you to, I want, and, and in terms of UFOs, legitimate UFOs, let's remember that the Pentagon is not in the habit of publicizing threats 
it cannot deal with. So the, 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 the Pentagon is not going to go out there and say, yeah, we're encountering these UFOs that are evading us and that we can't catch and we can't shoot down. They'll never say that because, because that's a threat they can't deal with, and so they're not going to publicize it. Um, but, and, and to kind of, to, to put my final thought on this, remember a few days ago, a couple of days ago, the Pentagon briefed Congress mm. on, the, on this situation. And I saw, I don't know if you saw these, but I saw two senators come out of that briefing and they had interesting commentary. Kennedy. Regarding that briefing. The first one was Senator Kennedy. The second one was Senator Hawley. Senator Kennedy said, we've seen this before. It's the same kind of stuff we've known about. We've, we've, we saw it in 2017, 2019. What's he referring to? The Nimitz incident. That's what he's referring to. So he's referring to the Tic Tac UFO. So... And then he added, lock your doors tonight, okay? So, so I got the impression from, from, from his comments, from Senator Kennedy's comments, that the Pentagon is briefing Congress, is telling Cong Congress that what they're shooting out of the sky is on the order of the Nimitz incident, tic-tac, UFO type activity. I'm sorry, that's BS, that's total BS. That's BS. I'm with you on that they're one. Lying, they're lying to Congress. And then I heard, and then what sort of confirmed that they're lying to Congress, the Pentagon is lying to Congress, is Josh Hawley. Senator Josh Hawley said, we, we're not getting any straight answers. None of this is making any sense. Why would he say that? Because they're, because they're probably telling them, hey, remember the Nimitz incident, the Tic Tac UFO? Yeah, we're still dealing with that stuff. And Josh Hawley's sitting there thinking, but you shot these things out of the sky with Sidewinder missiles? <laughs> Something's not fitting here. Those two things don't go together. Chinese balloons and legitimate UFOs, you're, you're, you're shooting these things out of the sky with Sidewinder missiles. I'm not putting these pieces together. And, I, I'm, and so I am, I am at this point very confident that the Pentagon is lying to Congress to cover up the fact that the Biden administration has had our Air Force shooting Hobby Lobby balloons out of the sky. And in that and respect, that, that, that's my analysis. I don't even know at that point why they even need to scramble the jets, because uh, ever since we were given a week of that the Chinese balloon going from Alaska to Myrtle Beach, where everybody the DOD was saying, "Hey, if you want to go see it, go out." They were encouraging everybody to go outside and look up and see it with the naked eye. Ever since then, it's just been reports. We haven't seen any. And there's no nothing recovered. There's there's no there's no nothing. So no. It, it really is just like a flea circus at this point. Now, do you? And they said, did you hear what they said today? What I heard it on the, in my I was driving my truck and I was listening to the news and I heard them say, um, the, the the Pentagon has announced that it's concluded its efforts to uh, retrieve the object it shot down in the Arctic Ocean near Alaska because the waters are too cold and conditions are too difficult. They weren't <laughs> able to recover it. Right. Are you kidding me? Right. We can recover whatever we want, whenever, wherever. That's a matter of fact. We have unmanned um, uh, vehicles that we can put in the water. We don't. It, it's not about guys and diving in the Arctic water. We have submarines. Well, I mean, I well, mean, we we can get whatever we want. Well, Timothy, and the reason why they're not recovering it is because it's embarrassing. What they shot down is either surveillance craft from China, Russia, or Iran, or it's a freaking Hobby Lobby balloon. That's more so what I'm thinking, uh, because and so they don't want egg on their face. They don't want to. They don't want to say, "Yeah, we scrambled jets," because China's already laughing at us. They're, they, I mean, Xi Jinping is is laughing his ass off at Biden right now. It's a big joke in China. Well, what would be left of a thirteen dollar balloon if they shot it with a five hundred thousand dollar missile? That's the other thing there too. You know, why are we shooting these things with Sidewinder missiles? Also, I, what the hell is wrong with us? A, a, who in their right mind thought it was a good idea to blow a balloon up with a missile? Why can't we s capture the balloon, deflate it? Why can't we like shoot a freaking dart at it and let it slowly come down and then and then re and then recover the technology completely intact? Exactly. It is. It is either. It's. I think it's a combination of incompetence. Number one, first and foremost, there's no question about it. We are looking at rank incompetence. Number one. And number two, this is a PSYOP on the American people. Just like COVID was a PSYOP, 
this is a psyop. They're, they are, they want this big distraction. They want all of us to be talking about UFOs, ironically enough. But it also, I was talking to some folks on another podcast the other day, and it occurred to me that this is a really good opportunity for the CIA to conflate the U, the the real UFO phenomenon with balloons, yeah, and, and with uh, ridiculous and, crap. And going back to what you were saying about uh, about uh, Senator Kennedy, he, I was saying that in the opening before I, I brought you on, he came out of that briefing a few days ago, and he was expressing an alarming amount of confusion. And I really did believe that he did not know much when he said, "I th- this is ridiculous," because it's clear at that point. For me, it had already been clear that they want this shiny object. This they want this shiny object to be as shiny as possible for reasons that uh, we're 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 going to find out about one way or another. First of all, the chaos level is so high with all of these things happening around the world and domestically. You you listed a lot of them over there. I was talking to a few friends um, for a moment there, Tim. I, I really did believe that they were going to do it. I thought that they were going to roll the dice on Bluebeam. I really thought that they were going to go for it. Because well, the, the, the fact that the UFO nomenclature was being used by the same people who were rebranding it UAP for the last however many years, mm-hmm. that they wanted the attention, that they went yep. back into the old pop culture craze of UFO, and they abandoned their own re- revised nomenclature. It's just... It, they wanted us to theorize. That's very perceptive of you. Indeed, they jettisoned the, their new their new speak, UAP. They jettisoned it in favor of the old school UFO nomenclature. Isn't that interesting? That right there indicates a psyop. Right there. So let's talk about Bluebeam for a minute because this is the this is the big thing all over Twitter and Instagram and all over, you know, the social media. Project Bluebeam is was a pro- legitimate project uh, that was conspired decades ago to fake a UFO invasion, to fake an alien invasion. And, and the idea was that they were going to do it with the, 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 the most advanced technology that they had. They would marshal to this task, even holographic type stuff. And uh, they, they would try and fake this invasion so that they, conso- they could, could, so that they could consolidate the, the nations together into a global government to address that problem. Of course, we have that famous quote by Ronald Reagan uh, addressing this very concept. Um, and it, it, it was a real project. But there's a problem with Bluebeam that that most people are not adding into this equation. So I do acknowledge that Bluebeam existed. It's it, it's it was on the books and maybe it's still on the books. But my contention today is it's not necessary anymore because we actually have an alien threat. We have a real one. We don't need to contrive a new alien threat. We don't need to contrive an alien invasion. We have legitimate UFO activity, and we have the abduction program that's happening every day, every single day, tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands, if not millions of human beings are being abducted routinely from the time they're toddlers until the time they're into their old age and are being subjected to this hybrid breeding program. We have the threat. They have, and they have all the receipts to prove that we have the threat. So. If there's a real alien threat, and it's the it's a it's the Grays, by the way. If there's a real alien threat, why then would we need to contrive one with Project Bluebeam? It doesn't make any sense. And by the way, it took us decades. And when I say us, I mean the, specifically the United States military. It took it took us decades to understand what the Grays were up to. How can I say that so confidently? Because if you read read the abduction material, you can you can. Um, uh, you will be informed about the government's curiosity, more than curiosity, the government's hostile treatment of alien abductees. In other words, people who were being abducted by aliens were later subjected to a far worse experience, which are called military abductions, my labs. So if you're an abductee back in the 80s, I don't don't believe they're doing this anymore routinely, but they were back in the 70s, 80s, and early 90s. If you're an abductee, you get abducted by aliens. The, the the routine abduction procedure takes place. The, the routine abduction episode. The the Grays put you back, 
and then military personnel pull up to your farmhouse. Usually it's in a, they choose people who live in isolated locations. They come into your home, they sweep your home, and they abduct you. They abduct you or, or your children or your spouse, whoever was abducted by the Greys, and they take you to a military base, usually an Air Force base, and they subject you to uh, interrogation, hostile interrogation. They do medical things to you, experiments to see what try, they're trying to figure out what the Greys are doing to the abductees. This was going on for decades, and it's a it's it, it was almost as routine as alien abductions, and not, although not as widespread, obviously. And so the, the military was trying to figure out what the Greys were doing for decades. And so once they realized what the threat was from the Greys, I think Project Bluebeam just became no longer necessary because they, they uncovered the actual threat. There's no reason to contrive a fake alien invasion because real aliens exist. And they're already engaged in hostile activities against the human race. And the, the alien, the UFO activity is becoming more and more aggressive. The posture is becoming more hostile. They're, they're buzzing our fighter jets now. They're hovering over our secret military installations. They're harassing our uh, battleships, harassing in the sense that they're, they're hovering in the vicinity of our battleships, which, which is a harassment in military terms. You have, a, you have an unidentified object hovering around a battleship. That's a serious deal. That's, that's, it's not just like, oh, look, a UFO. That poses a clear and present danger. So um, the threat is real. So you tell me, if we have a legitimate threat from an extraterrestrial faction, and it is an extraterrestrial faction, it's an alien faction for sure, I believe it is an extraterrestrial faction with bases on Earth and bases on the moon as well, and perhaps other places. You have this real threat. Why then would you ever need to contrive a threat with technology and holographic projections and all of the energy and money that would go into that? So I think Project Bluebeam is dead, honestly. I, me, I, my questions that pop up along with what you had uh, along the way of, of what you were just laying out there is there must be at that point some kind of coordination between government and et to be able to uh, to, to do one thing or another and is there no light opposition to something like that is it only just all conniving evil uh parasitic forces is there no light opposition to anything and uh, and that's where i start getting into a little bit more going back into um, uh, uh, biblical stories that you have laid out for uh, extraterrestrial and ancient kind of um, not only uh, uh, ancient warfare and, and everything else like that. Is there no balancing, balancing power yes. to it all? Yes, there is. That's the only reason why we haven't been obliterated on planet Earth. See, as everybody in your audience, I'm sure, knows by now, I come from a biblical worldview. And I believe it's the most plausible worldview. It's not because I was born a Christian. It's because it is the most plausible worldview. It makes sense of everything. And therefore, coming from this view, I understand that there are, there are non-human actors that are involved in the narrative of the human species on planet Earth and have been involved in our story since the beginning. So we might call them ancient aliens because that would actually be a fitting description, although I do not uh, concur with most of the conclusions drawn by the program Ancient Aliens. But I do concur with, with the concept. The premise is correct. It is a biblical premise. So mankind has been in contact with extraterrestrials, biblically speaking, since the beginning. There's no argument that that, there's no argument that that could be otherwise, no scriptural argument um, that could be marshaled. Because as I've explained on your show before, extraterrestrial simply means not from the earth. And when we're talking about, you know, let's, let's, let's make it in the context of sentient beings. So a, a being whose provenance, whose origin is other than planet earth. And I don't care if you're talking about some other dimension, some spiritual realm, or a planet, it makes no difference. If that being is not from planet Earth, 
then then it is by definition extraterrestrial, also alien. So, so from a biblical worldview, of course, extraterrestrials exist. There were beings in existence before the earth was created, according to the book of Job. The book of Job says that the Benai Elohim, the sons of God, shouted for joy when the earth was created. So there's a race of entities who come from a civilization who pre-exist mankind. That is extraterrestrial. And they are not all bad. In fact, the majority of them are good. And so, uh, and uh, that's the, again, it's the only reason that mankind has not been annihilated on planet Earth, because we're being protected. We're being protected by the good guys in so much as we don't make deals with the bad guys. As um, long as, rather, we don't make deals with the bad guys, which I think, unfortunately, we have and are. And so we have good actors and bad actors, extraterrestrial, operating in our airspace. And I would say that that, as bizarre as that may sound to your listeners, that is a, that is, that fits comfortably within the biblical paradigm. So let me get into this now, because when we talk about the, a, this paradigm in which there is a, an, an, an extraterrestrial um, uh, existence, a, a force there, whether it be all different types of, of races or who knows, and then you have earthly entities, you have governments, you have intelligence organizations, you have people, just regular old citizens like us who are, are curious and, and exploring, and um, and then you put it all together, and there's just a, I mean, it's, it's a mess. It's a real big chaotic mess. Everybody is trying to seek out their own ends. Some plots bigger than others. Um, one of those one of those bad guys, those groups of bad guys. I really do believe we get to watch a lot more closely and out from behind closed doors these days are the Davos types. Now I want to play something for you because this goes into a lot of what you write about extensively into the coming post-human uh, era with AI and, and transhumanism. Uh, Klaus Schwab at the World Government Summit the other day, this is about a minute long, uh, about a minute 22 long, and at the end of it, I mean, the entire thing here, he talks about, I mean, there was one other person, one other clip we watched last night where we had these people making statements about the transition into this new world order needs to be something that has a violent catalyst, that we can't do it slowly because ultimately the way the world is now, uh, there's too much of an inconvenient level of political and cultural diversity, and that makes it difficult for them to get what they want. But among them, of course, was Klaus Schwab, and listen to what he says about the power that will be created through the technologies that we once thought were science fiction not too long ago. And, uh, and the way that he ends this is just incredible, and I, and I w would like to just get some comment from you. So uh, here it is. You'll hear it. I wrote in 2015 the book, The Fourth Industrial Revolution, and I mentioned 23 or 24 technologies which would change the world, like crypto and so on and so on. The book was considered science fiction. All those technologies have become reality, and there are new technologies. And I would say we are in the second minute, or whatever you, we want to call, we are at the beginning. When you look at, it, at technology transformation, it usually takes place in, in the terms of an S-curve, and we are just now where we move into the exponential phase. And I agree, artificial intelligence, but not only artificial intelligence, <clears throat> but also the metaverse, new space technologies, and I could go on and on, synthetic biology. Our life in 10 years from now will be completely different, very much affected, and who masters those technologies in some way will be the master of the world. So AI, cybernetics, um, uh, what, uh, synthetic biology, the metaverse, and who masters those technologies will be, in a way, the masters of the world. Go ahead. Absolutely. Al. I mean, just, that's true. It's everything that's you, absolutely true. Everything you wrote about. Yeah. Uh, I mean, 
we are living, as I've said before in your program, we're living in what's called the hybrid age. The reason why technologists call this the hybrid age is because you have all of these disparate technologies that are being developed in the background. And most of them are on an exponential developmental path. In other words, they're doubling and tripling every, every, every year. They're doubling and tripling and quadrupling their potential and, and their capabilities. So these technologies are, most of them are in the realm of biotechnologies. In other words, technologies that are, can be integrated into biological, into a biological substrate, into human beings or into animals. And some of them have to do with artificial intelligence. And so all of these things are developing simultaneously, concurrently. You have nanotechnology, which is quietly developing. You have, um, you have the, the, the Neuralink type technology, the brain chip interface, of course, artificial intelligence, various artificial intelligences, by the way, that different companies are creating. Google has one. Um, different companies have their own artificial intelligence uh, uh, platforms that they're developing. All of these things in the past have been running on their on separate rails, so to speak. And right now they're converging. And when these things come together, and this is what I, this is what I predict in my book, when these things come together, when they fully mesh together, when they have, when, when they have fully converged, we will have the power among many other things, we will have the power to totally remake human biology, to redesign ourselves to some extent. And that is where this is all headed. It is headed towards a post-human paradigm. And, there, and I am fully confident of the fact that, that the globalists at Davos, that the World Economic Forum globalists absolutely know, they know they're working toward and they're anticipating a humanless future. A scenario on planet Earth in which the, the vast majority of mankind has evolved out of Adam, so to speak, out of the human condition into a post-human condition. I call this the post-human apocalypse the post-human paradigm, which is an apocalypse, the post-human apocalypse. They view it. They view, the, they view it as the opposite. They view it as a, a garden of Eden that they're creating in the future for themselves and for as many people as they deem fit to inhabit this garden of Eden with them. Because the vast majority of the human race is viewed with contempt by these people. It is not an overstatement to say that they would very much like for most of us to drop dead. That is an accurate statement. They have said it in so many ways. They would, they would like nothing more than for the most of us to die. They don't need the workforce anymore. The fourth industrial uh, revolution is not like the first industrial revolution. The first industrial revolution, you needed a workforce. So many people were needed for this workforce that they were making four and five and six and seven year olds work in factories. Remember those days? Yep. I mean, reading about those days when children were working in factories 12 hours a day, it's because they did not have enough manpower. The demand was so high. The industrial revolution was, was was so demanding in terms of human manpower and in, in, in terms of uh, of manpower and human effort that it required a, a large percentage of mankind to be engaged in it on some level most of them working in factories and cities uh that's not to say that most of the populace was working in factories but it required a lot of the populace you, the, the 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 lower class obviously to be working in these factories well the fourth industrial revolution is going to be more transformative than the first industrial revolution however the opposite is going to be true it is not going to require hardly any human beings to do anything because it's going to be automated and it's going to be robotic and it's going to be governed and programmed by artificial intelligence. They don't need you anymore.
That's the point. They don't need you anymore. And when I say you, I mean me and all of us. They don't need us. And so their plan is to reduce the population and then and then transition the human beings that remain on Earth into a post-human condition. And everything will be 100% controlled from a central hub, a power structure. Yes, the new world order. And and so they're envisioning a humanless future. And 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 they're all sitting around and, and patting themselves on the back about how benevolent they are. Why? Because they're going to save the planet by killing most of us cockroaches running around and ruining, ruining it. I'm just telling this is the theology, okay? It is a theology. This is their theology. And and how they get there, there's any number of ways that they can, any number of avenues that they can take. But I believe, and, and this is what I... This is what I lay out in my book, Birthright, that there are three primary components that are coming together. And when these components come together, that's when we're going to see the fruition of all of this. You have, you have the, uh, you have post-humanism, transhumanism, those technologies, the, the hybrid age that's unfolding right now. That's one sphere. You have a new religion that is growing in tandem with, with the post humanism, transhumanism, which I call apotheotheism, this new religion. And then you have the third sphere, which is the alien threat. And these three things, picture three circles being slowly pushed together. They're I'm, converging. I'm glad you're bringing this up because I wanted to ask you how essential, if at all, and I know we're seeing where it is essential, is this 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 uh, this specific brand of UFO deception to the coming post-human age? That you write about how how essential is that that alien threat to the the coming age that you are you're uh, sketching out for us right now? Well, I believe that the alien threat is going to usher in our extraterrestrial saviors, so to speak. I would not view them as our saviors. I would view them as the enemies of mankind. But most of mankind will receive them as the saviors. And yes, I'm talking about the Antichrist. So, I believe that. The threat is going to be made known at some point in the future. The 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 threat, the, the real alien threat, not Project Bluebeam, the real alien threat. And it is real, and it is going to take the collective effort of all governments to even have a chance to combat it. But even still, even then, it will be futile. Resistance is futile against the Greys because they're integrating a very the antithesis of the Borg, actually. They're integrating into human society with advanced human hybrids, what Dr. David Jacobs calls hubrids. And these hybrids are integrating into human society, and we cannot identify them. They look exactly like us. For all intents and purposes, they are us, but they're not us on a genetic level. They're part us, and they're part them. And so... What is the purpose of these hybrids? Nobody really knows. Are they supposed to are they supposed to integrate into government? Are they supposed to integrate into finance? Are they supposed to integrate into the military apparatuses of, of every nation and, and then take over from within? I don't know, but it is a it is a unassailable threat when you combine the technology of the Greys and the fact that the hybrids are integrated into human society and we can't identify them. This is an unassailable threat. And so we're going to need help dealing with it. We are going to need to be saved and add into that equation something that I, I don't add into my book, but if I, if I were to make an amendment to my book, I would add this, this other thing in there, and that is there may be some kind of an impending natural disaster coming, whether it be a comet or a pole shift, something is brewing. And so there may be a natural disaster, an alien threat, and who knows what else going on, we are going to be in a position where we need to be saved. We are going to need to be rescued. And in that moment, I believe that the saviors are going to appear and are going to deliver us from the alien threat. This is what I posit in my book. They're going to deliver us from the alien threat. And these are going to be very beautiful, intelligent beings. And, and they're going to basically represent a potential transformation of the human species itself. In other words, we can become like them through technology and by adopting some of their genetic code into our own genome. And, and this all sounds crazy and it is speculative, obviously, but I, it, it, it's well documented in my book, Birthright. So if you think this is crazy, totally 
uh, sci-fi maybe you won't think so you won't you won't think it's that far-fetched if, if you read the book there's less and less reason to think that any of this stuff um is only going to be relegated to the category of science fiction when we're already living in an age where the the, the everyday realities uh, were were conceived as imp- Im- Ill, they're inconceivable uh, so long ago, I mean, even Klaus Schwab just said it. Things that he was publishing in 2015 is is now really has put us on the on the track toward a world where uh, the the Borg is is the is the standard. My whole thing there though is that uh, well, first of all, if there were a malevolent ETI out there, I would be working through the Davos crowd, no doubt about it. That's what I would be doing. But uh, again, who who's in our corner? I know I I believe in God. Um, it would be great if one of those old school biblical uh, war, uh, wars would break out, and we'd, uh, well, we'd we'd be able to confirm that there's some angels. That's precisely what's going to happen. That's oh. called Armageddon. Okay. Well, then, Armageddon is not else. a war with Israel. Armageddon is a war with God, and specifically, it's a war with the returning Christ. And it is a kinetic war. It's not a spiritual war. It's not a dimensional war. It's a kinetic war. It's te- it's a technological war. And the the context of Armageddon is is the beast and his armies are preparing for war against Israel against Israel, and then Christ returns and makes war with the beast and cr- utterly crushes him, annihilates him. And so Armageddon is war with God, and that's where all of this is heading. I mean, th- that is the culmination of everything that is happening now. Mankind is being led, will be led into open war with God. And when I say mankind, really what I mean is this post-human populace that's going to be on Earth. You, Yuval Harari says one to 200 years, there's not gonna be any human beings left on Earth. And you know what? He's absolutely correct. There will be always a remnant of human beings left. They're going to be persecuted. They're not going to have access to the system. That's why the Bible says in Revelation that they won't be able to buy or sell. They will not be able to have access to the system because they're not going to be plugged into it. They're not going to be interfacing with it through their brains. They're not going to be in this post-human condition. They're going to be good old-fashioned crappy human beings living out their lives wherever they can manage away from this this satanic empire that's rising in the earth. And make no mistake, the reason why this is happening, because there's got to be a reason. It's not just contempt for the human species that's driving this. Like you have a lot of people, maybe even in your audience, who are atheistic or agnostic, and they, but they, they concur that there's this global... Uh, this global empire rising. You got these guys like Klaus Schwab, who are these, who are these uh, almost comical, sinister, evil characters from a comic book. And, and but what is driving them? What is the ultimate goal? It's not just to get rid of human beings and live forever. No, it's more insidious than that. The ultimate goal is to make war with God. As crazy as that seems, that is exactly what the Bible describes in the book of Revelation. That is the end of the book. Well, the end of the book is the victory of the Son of God who returns to crush the beast and absolutely lay waste to his empire. So that's the good news. That's the good news. That is the good news. Uh, You you know, the the question that always comes back to me, um, as inspiring as that all is chaotic and scary and inspiring, a really triumphant end, it always makes me wonder why even attempt it? If you are the beast, why even attempt it? And, and, for, and to have it be uh, predestined, uh, su- such a, a, a humiliating loss, why? J- just for the couple thousand years of, 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 uh, you know, of mischief? Is, is it just- really that worth it? Because it has to do what I call the dragon slayer prophecy, Genesis 3. There's a prophecy in Gen- Genesis 3. My friend Eli Marsuli calls it the seed war prophecy in which, in which a proclamation comes forth from the lips of God to the serpent after the Eden affair, after the serpent beguiles Eve and, and that whole affair. God pronounces to the serpent that that he would be at enmity with the seed of his of the woman that her seed and his seed would be at enmity that he would bruise his heel meaning the seed of the of the woman but but that her seed would crush his head would absolutely 
obliterate him, destroy him. And so, yes, the dragon knows, and of course the dragon is a moniker, I think the most fitting moniker for this character we call Satan. Lucifer is a misnomer, actually. The Bible never actually, uh, the Bible never identifies, it never names this nefarious character. There are, the, 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 the term Satan, uh, and the and the term devil are ambiguous and and can be applied to satins. It can be plural, satins, devils. But there's this one insidious character who seems to be the chief of them all. He is the he is the supreme rebel, uh, and he is never actually named. His name is not Lucifer. He's not actually named. He it's it's like Harry Potter. He's like Voldemort. Voldemort. Uh, he who should not be named, or whatever they say about him, you know who. Uh, he's such a contemptible character that he's not that he's not ever uh, given the the uh, the privilege of of being named in the scripture. So that person, that being, is doing everything he can to forestall his fate and mm. to resist because he knows when his fate's going to happen. It's going to happen when the king of heaven shows up with the armies of heaven in train to crush his head. And that is called Armageddon. And so that is what all of this is about. And by the way, the agency of the beast, the reason why you have the beast arising, who's, who I believe is going to be the hybrid offspring, the hybrid son of the dragon. So in other words, the dragon's going to copulate with a human woman and give birth to what, what is effectively another, a Nephilim, wow. a modern Nephilim, and that that being is going, that person, the, the beast, the Antichrist, is going to govern the earth for a time. He's authorized to do so. The book of Revol Revelation says he's, he's given a time. He's authorized to take control of the earth for a period of time. And the reason why, what is the mechanism here? So if I said in the, earlier that, that the earth is being protected, that, that there's good guys out there, and that most of these entities actually are good and not evil. Okay, so why then would all these things unfold? Because of human agency. Because mankind was given the deed of the earth, the mandate to govern the earth. It is our birthright. And Paul says that the gifts and the calling of God are irrevocable, Paul writes in the New Testament. So Adam was given the mandate, the birthright, the deed to the earth. And as long as he remains human, he retains dominion of the earth. But as soon as he forfeits his humanity, he forfeits the dominion, the birthright associated with him and now maybe your audience knows why i called my book birthright and so there's the mechanism the mechanism is that we have authority on earth but we can abdicate our authority to the enemies of god and to the enemies of mankind and ultimately we can forfeit our birthright by becoming something other than human i.e post human knocking on that door walking through the threshold and uh, and watching it all play out it, it is a it is a thrilling time to be alive and to be learning about this stuff that is for that is for certain and uh timothy we, we did a lot tonight but i want to ask you one more question that actually that was inspired by somebody who wrote in uh to the show her name is melissa and i think this is a great question and i want to know uh what you may have on this it, it it's this she pretty much tells me that she never called into the show, but she wanted to say, tell me and you that uh, I, they, she had a personal witnessing. So she had witnessed a few nights ago a very UFO-like situation in the sky outside of her house. Now, uh, she started de describing this exactly like what people were seeing with the Phoenix Lights in 1997. And the reason why I thought this was a really great topic to bring up with you and for a final question is this. We are used to seeing now, because of Starlink, these daisy chains of satellites making appearances in the sky in these long, twinkling uh, strings uh, right through the sky. But back in 1997, there was no explanation for the Phoenix Lights. So was in your opinion or or in from whatever you have learned from the abductees you've talked to in, in your many years of, of research was the technology that was on display in 97 in phoenix was that was that merely starlink kind of stuff that was 30 years no. ahead of its time or was there details about phoenix lights that suggest something was off world that was responsible for it no that vehicle was not in orbit that was uh 
uh, at probably a high altitude, but certainly not in low orbit. And it was triangular in shape. It was a, it was a delta-shaped craft. And even some people claim to have seen sort of the shadowy outline of the actual hardware, not just the lights. Um, and it was a very large craft. So the, the Phoenix lights were not just lights and they weren't satellites. That was a delta-shaped craft, an immense craft. Um, have you ever spoken to anybody, um, any, any kind of uh, discussion you've had with abductees that gave you special insight into the insides of some of these crafts? Well, sure, sure. Abductees always report. Uh, and by the way, when you talk about talking to abductees, I don't do uh, hypnotic regression. I don't do the kind of uh, techniques that good um, good ab- abductee interviewers do, like the late uh, like uh, the late Bud Hopkins and uh, Carla Turner and David Jacobs and so and some of these old school researchers. Because if you if you just interview somebody who has conscious recall, most abductees don't have conscious recall. They, they might remember something funny happened. They have marks on their bodies when they woke up in the morning. Something funny happened at night. They remember, like, hearing voices in their head or something or a little man with a big bald head standing by their bed or something like that. So most abductees don't have conscious recall. And all abductees have screen memories. So, um, so I think we've talked about this before, that an abductee, the, 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 the greys implant false memories called screen memories to to block access to the real memories because the project is clandestine the abduction project is clandestine the greys don't not want us to know to figure out what they're doing so um if you just if you happen to encounter an abductee who has conscious recall number one that's very rare number two their conscious recall is going to be it's going to involve a lot of confabulation it's going to involve a lot of elements that are added in. The gaps are being filled uh, by their imagination because they're not supposed to remember the actual event. So, however, when abductees are properly interviewed and debriefed, and it's not just a one-time thing, like you, there's people who dedicate, you have to dedicate hours and hours, part of your life to this. I don't do it. I lead on the experts who did do it. And we have enough material now to draw from. We don't even need any new material, although I think it would be helpful. But if you draw from the authentic, let's not call it authentic, let's call it the competent abduction research that was done by people like Jacobs and Turner and Hopkins and Mack and others, although although all of their um, conclusions are a little bit different, if you draw on that body of work, that old school body of work, then you will find a lot of um, many, many, many similarities between all of the, the, the various abduction accounts when those people are properly debriefed after multiple sep- uh, sessions, weeding out confabulation and, and, and circumventing the, uh, the false memories, the screen memories. Most of these people describe the exact same kind of craft. They're on a craft. It's, uh, it's sort of an off-white, white, off-white color inside. There's nothing angular inside the craft. There are no seams. There are no nails. There are, there's no, um, uh, what do you call it, uh, around our doors and around our, 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 our walls and stuff. What do you call that? The, the trim. There's no trim. Um, the, all of the doorways are curved, are curvature. All of the spaces are curved. Uh, like, for example, so many abductees have described a waiting lobby sort of a thing it's just very plain area where they where they have the abductees waiting to be processed um before they disrobe them and they're sitting on a bench so many of so many abductees have described this and i've talked to abductees who have described described this very thing to me uh sort of like a bench that's almost molded into the wall that's how the doorways are and they all describe the same kind of tables um the same utensils so yes, there's to answer your question. There's a lot of information regarding the interior of these crafts from abductees, and and so much of it is correlated among abductees, uh, corroborated among abductees. The details. It's 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 actually quite remarkable. We I don't. It's it, the body of evidence for the abduction program for the for, for the abduction phenomenon is scientific. It lends itself to scientific inquiry. It is remarkable. Hmm. 
I, I mean, I, I've listened to a lot of David Jacobs' interviews. Um, Bud Hopkins, I've read into his work before. The others that you listed, I did not. I think the spookiest of all of the of the uh, the uh, abduction stories and accounts that have been verified, like you say, by science, are things like the disappearing pregnancies. The, yes. go, the where they're gone, the pregnancies are just disappear from from That's a woman's right. womb. They're gone, um, and so there. There's just so much. I would love to dive into that again with uh, w- one night with you. That would be wonderful. I know a little bit about the screening, uh, the the implanted memories, like you're talking about from movies like The Fourth Kind with that barn mm-hmm. owl. They the implanting the barn owl. Precisely. So I there's there's a lot there. I'd love to just expand one night, and and we'll do it. I'm sure. Um, if, in the meantime, why don't you let people know what is on your agenda next? Any kind of appearances, any kind of live streams you have coming up, and of course, Timothy Albert com is in the description. I hope people go and and buy all your your uh, your books and and watch your videos. But go ahead, tell us what's coming up. I'm going to be in Nashville, Tennessee for the for the Blurry Con. It's a conference being put up put on by the by the Blurry Creatures podcast guys, Nate and Luke, um, and for some other smaller events. Those are sold out. However, I am about to launch a trip to. Uh, Cusco, Peru, going to the megaliths. It's, we're going to visit the, explore the megaliths in Cusco and in Ojante Tambo and Machu Picchu. And I'm doing that. It's a public trip. Um, and I haven't officially, I've got all the details ready. I just haven't launched it yet. It's ready to be launched. It's going to be launched probably next week. Uh, if you want to go to Peru with me, I'm, um, I've got an amazing trip put together. I'm working with my friend Andre Sadazme, who is an archaeo astronomer. And uh, we both love talking about megaliths and giants and lost civilizations. And uh, I don't really think you're going to ever find another trip like this. So this trip will be launching sometime next week, if not the following week. And if you're interested in going, then you got to follow my mailing list and my YouTube channel and follow me on social media because that's where I'm going to announce it. Um, So... If you want to, if you want to follow me on social media, it's just Timothy Alberino everywhere. It's Timothy Alberino, YouTube, um, um, YouTube, Twitter, Instagram. I'm the only Timothy Alberino. Now, if you see Timothy Alberino underscore something or Timothy Alberino dot or Timothy dot Alberino, it's not me. Mine's always Timothy Alberino. No spaces, no dots, no underscore, no nothing. Timothy Alberino on social media, and. Uh, and timothyalbrino.com. Well, I have uh, for my I'm my all my Twitter marketing for the for the evening and elsewhere wherever I put out the live links, I did tag you there. So, if you're if you are following me on Twitter, uh, you just go to my most recent tweet and Tim is is tagged right there. You click right through and you'll be on his his profile. Uh, Tim, uh, uh, thank you so much for spending some time with me tonight. Again, congratulations on on the Bannon uh, uh, appearance, and I hope and I know uh, much more like that is coming your way. Because as I have, I, I've been saying a lot more these days, Tim, it is becoming more and more clear to people, especially in the media who are willing to have real conversations, that there are less and less political. De- uh, ways to describe what we're living through right now. Politics is just not going to cut it anymore. We got to go beyond that, and and I think that's why people like you are going to be tapped on the shoulder more and more uh, to discuss where the hell we're going as a species. So again, thanks for your efforts and your availability, and we'll talk soon. It's always a pleasure, Frank, and it's it's all, and it's it's exciting watching your ascendancy as well. Your your podcast, you got a great podcast, so. I'm always excited to be a part of it. All right, man. I'll I'll have a good one. Send my best to the family. Thank you.